Okay, hello everyone. Thank you a lot for inviting me to talk at the Munich C++ meetup. Um, my name is Juanpe and I'm Spanish, but I've been living in Berlin for quite some time. Still, my German is not good enough to have this talk in German. Um, and I work as a freelance engineer and consultant, focusing mostly on interactive software. I also worked a lot in the music software industry. And well, I'm going to talk today about the most valuable values. What values? Of course, it could be ethical values or economic value, but that's not going to be the case. Of course, it's going to be about the our favorite values, which are uh, <clears throat> okay, whatever. Yeah, so the presenter is not working. I will just have to do this manually. Uh, it's going to be, of course, about value semantics. <clears throat> now, what is value semantics? I guess more, most people in the room should have an intuition about what value semantics is, because it's very one of the core concepts of C++, especially of modern C++. But I'm going to try to step back a little bit and talk about value semantics in a very general way. So value semantics. What is value semantics? On the one hand, we're talking about semantics. This is meaning. What meaning? The meaning of our programs. And then we're talking about values. Basically, we want to understand what our programs mean by understanding what values are assigned to the different entities in our programs. That's what value semantics is really about. It's about understanding programs through values as opposed to through references and other things. Now, what's a value? Well, I'm going to start just by giving examples of things that we normally consider values as programmers. But let's try to not think about it only as you know, C++ programmers. So of course, the number 42 is a value of the very value semantic type int. Uh, the color blue is a value. Why not? Especially if you're programming CSS, it's a value that you may use a lot. A string of characters is a value, like my name, Juan Bolivar. A function, is it a value? Well, it, conceptually, yes. In your programming language, it might depend. But it's a value. And it's a very interesting kind of values, right? Because the most interesting thing we do with values is to give them names, I would say. And here we're giving a name, which is f, to this function, which is a value in itself. And the function is basically just a relationship between other values. And this relationship here, it's uh, determined by this value x that is related to the result of the function, which is x to the fourth power. Another possible value, well, in integral numbers, natural numbers. Why not? C++ developer might be thinking like, oh, but this doesn't fit in my memory. Well, it depends on how you represent them. No, it's a value. Why not? It's a concept I can think about, I can talk about. In this sense, it's a value. And actually, there are many languages that where this is not represented, of course, as all the numbers, but it's represented just as a symbol. And you can you, you know, do computations on what this is and, and study the properties of this value, n. So one thing that we have to be careful, though, I said I have values here on the screen, but the values, they're not really in the screen. What you're looking at in the screen is representations of values, right? Like the electrons coming out of this projector to your Hell, they are representations of values. Binary sequences in the memory of your program representing the number 42, blue, or whatever, they are representations of values. The real values, I would argue, they are in your head, right? So for this reason, I think like when talking about value semantics, it's uh, very useful to think of the myth of the cave of the philosopher Plato. Um, because Plato was an idealist, and he had this notion of ideas, of um, yeah, platonic ideals, which I think is um, very related to how we think about values in programming. And Plato said that basically we are like the slaves in this bottom part of the picture, that basically we are chained and looking at the world only through shadows, because there is a wall behind us, so we can only see the shadows of the things that are projected from above the wall. Now, these shadows would be the representations, right? The sequence of bits I was talking about. But the reality, he said, is these pure ideas, these pure concepts that are behind the wall, and that, of course, if you're a philosopher and become enlightened, you will truly see uh, through reason. And 
<clears throat> I think um, once we start thinking about values in this way as ideas, um, it's, it's useful. But then we get to also like conflicts, right? Like, let's talk about this value. I said, this is a string, the string Juan P. Bolivar. What if I remove the scare quotes and I just say, this is myself, I'm referring to myself. Like, am I a value? Are you seeing a value here in the stage right now? <laughs> well, let's study a little bit what values are. I'm going to use this platonic notion of idea to talk about values. So values are abstract. They are immaterial. They don't exist, as I said. The only things that exist are representations. The values themselves, they are not material. They are necessary. There is no prior condition for them to exist. The number 42 is the number 42. You, know? you don't need even the universe for it to exist. Um, they are eternal. They are not created or destructed. And very importantly, they are immutable. Right? You cannot mutate them. You cannot change them. I can study the relationship between the number 42 and a related value. And this way, in this way, I can study change, for example. But I cannot change the number 42 in itself once I define it in a formal way. Now, I think I'm not like that, right? I am concrete, so I exist. I'm here in the real world. I am material. I'm made of atoms, I think, or I hope. I am contingent, right? I'm not necessary. I am contingent. I, uh, there are generations and generations of people that had to have sex at the right time, in the right moment, for me to exist right now. So I could very easily not exist as well. I am temporary. I will be dead one day, for sure. I was born one day also. And I am mutable, right? Like, I'm changing all the time. I'm moving across the states and doing all these stupid things. So um, I don't think I'm, I'm a value. I think I am something I'm going to just call a thing, right? And before people accuse me of Platonists, I think actually like from a philosophical point of view, Plato was wrong. Because Plato thought that um, things are actually less real. They become more real only when they are considered as platonic values, as platonic ideals. And I think that things like me, we are more real than the values. On the other hand, values are imaginary, but they are very useful. They are a very useful metaphor um, to, to understand how reasoning works and to think. right? Because basically, reasoning requires two things. On the one hand, it requires us to detach ourselves from our physical reality, right? I should be able to close my eyes, and I can still think about the audience, even though I don't see it anymore, right? Now the audience is becoming something like a value in my head, right? And the second thing it needs uh, beyond this detachment is abstraction, right? I need, I need to be able to generalize. I can actually think about the audience as a general term without counting every individual person in the room. Or even I can talk, think about audiences in general and think like, you know, if the audience is sad, I need to make a joke or something. Um, so, so this is how reasoning works. And I think, yeah, ideas, and in this case, values, are very useful. They are the fundamental tool that we're going to use uh, to think and to think in our programs. Now, if things are not values, but of course we want or programs to have an effect in the world. We want our programs to talk about the things in the real world. How can we connect these two worlds, right? The, the world of things and the world of values. And I would say there are three ways we can think about things uh, in terms of values. The first one is by considering the whole existence of a thing as a value, right? So you can imagine if the thing we're talking about is a person, you can imagine a moving picture of their whole life as a single value, right? And these values, they're very interesting. They're tricky also to represent in computers, because sometimes they even contain things that have not happened yet, right? If I talk about Juan P's life, Juan P's life, well, there are many things about Juan P's life that we don't know, because they haven't happened yet. Still, maybe we can study properties about them. Um, the other thing we can do is to, well, slice this movie of everything that is happening through time, and look at particular states of the thing. And this particular state might be represented in our computer as a value, a value I can study its properties and relate it to other things. Now, the problem is when, you have, when you're looking at particular states, these particular states might become disconnected from each other. 
and you still need to connect them somehow to the thing that exists in the real world. And for this, we use a tool which is identity, right? We give the, uh, the thing an identity, which is another value in itself, that we're going to use to relate all these different states or these different properties that are related uh, to the thing, to the actual thing. I'm a bit redundant now. So an example of this might be, if we're talking about myself, well, there are many different identities you can use. There is not only one possible identity, and it depends on the context, right? Like, this is my identity card, very obvious, the name says it, from the Spanish state that is going to distinguish myself from all other Spanish citizens, right? So in the context of Spanish bureaucracy, this is going to be the identity we're going to use to refer to the different states of myself, right? And make sure that the Juanpe that shows up in different bureaucracies and bureaus uh, is, is the same person. But in this room, probably I don't need this because I'm the only person called Juan P. Bolívar. So if you need to refer to myself, you're going to just say Juan P. Bolívar or maybe even just Juan P. Now, if I sign up uh, to apply to go to this meetup, though, maybe I will need to put my email address because this is the identity we're going to use to distinguish the people that is going to attend the meetup. But in many contexts, this might not be enough. And we can just generate an identity. This is something called a universally unique identifier. Uh, if you never heard this term, look it up in Wikipedia. It's basically a tool we have as programmers to give um, identities to things. And it's very used uh, in distributed systems, but I would argue that it's actually sometimes underused even in single-threaded and you know, non-distributed systems. So, OK, this was philosophical, kind of. Now we know a little bit about things and values and how can we relate the two. Um, let's talk about language, right? Because in the end, as I said before, like one of the most useful things we can do with values is give them names, such that we can talk about them, we can discuss, this, discuss them, we can communicate about values between people and between people and computers. So you have programming languages where basically you can give a name to a value Let's say, let x be the number 42. And once I introduce this name, I can use this value in other contexts, right? So I can say, y is x plus 2. And we know that it's going to be 44 in this case. We can do this with collections. And we can do this also with functions, right? So we can give a name f to the function. This is the function that we saw in the other slide, which in itself is also introducing a scope with a name x that is a parameter and that is, in the end, defining this relationship between values. The input value and the output value of the function. We can apply this function, and so on and so forth. And there are languages that I would say are very value semantic in this sense. Languages like Haskell. And they are very value semantic because in this programming language, the only thing you can give a name to is a value. But there are other languages, like this one which could be C, it could be Java, but for our purpose, it's going to be C++. Uh, what happens when I introduce this name foo in C++? Well, what's happening in C++ is that I'm giving a name to a thing. But this thing is a region in memory. So if these squares represent our memory, the memory of our program, um, this is giving a name to a region of it. And because it's the type int, it has, it's big enough to store representations of values as defined by you know, the semantics of int. And since I'm giving this initialization, in this particular case, well, as I said, the name is associated to the box. And then it's storing a representation of this value in that box. Now, it's very easy to think, and very often we do it, and that's good, that's kind of value semantics. We think, oh, we're giving foo the value 42. But in reality, in the formalities of the language, we're giving the name foo to uh, this thingy. And we know it's a thing because it has an identity. What's the identity of the box? Well, it's the pointer, right? And I can actually treat this pointer itself as a value. So pointers are values that represent the identity of the boxes in which we store things. And um, we can actually modify right, this box through this pointer now. And you know, uh, this kind of shows uh, that there is a thing, there is something more than just a value. <coughs> and 
And this is because in C++, uh, it's based on this notion of object. And I'm not talking about objects here as in object orientation, more about the standard C++ standard definition of object, which is basically a location, so a box like that, plus a type of the things that can fit in a box, plus a lifetime, right? So this box that is associated to the name food has a lifetime that is associated to the scope uh, of this block. You can also have dynamic lifetimes if you use new and delete, and so on and so forth. Now, think about what I said about identity, right? Identities are values in a, uh, are useful in a context, in a context that allows us in which the elements can be distinguished through this identity. Pointers are valid identities to distinguish alive objects, but not dead objects. This is why we have problems like dangling pro pointers in C++, right? So this is a tool to think about these kind of problems, right? <coughs> so, <coughs> Wittgenstein, oh, German words, uh, Wittgenstein said the limits of my language means the limits of my world. And this property of C++ that you can name objects, I mean, it's very useful, right? Because it allows us to really be close to the machine, to optimize things. But it's also a limitation. We cannot name values directly. And I think this leads to something that I call object fetishism, which basically it's that when all you can name is an object, everything looks like an object. We start thinking about the world in terms of objects, modeling our programs, designing our programs in terms of objects, instead of really thinking about the values uh, that are underlying or above, depending on how you look at it, um, this model, right? And I'm going to give you an example of this. Let's say we're implementing a database of people. Uh, this database of people is very simple. Uh, it's, we have this person value type. Uh, the structs are mostly values, right? Unless you do weird things with them. And we have a vector of people. So this is very valuey, I think. Uh, if you get into regular types and so on, you could argue about the implementation of equality and uh, equality comparisons and so forth. But in a very intuitive way, this is mostly a, a value type, right? Now, let's say I want to make my program more interesting. I want to add relationships between people. I want to add friends, right? So the first thing a C++ developer will do is to say, well, I have people. It's a struct. It's an object somewhere. My friends are pointers to my friends, to my other people. There is a problem with this program, right? Or with this representation now. Can someone tell me why? Well, I would argue that the biggest problem here is that we have pointers into the people, and the people are is a vector. Uh, and we know that the identities of the objects in the vector are not preserved when you manipulate the vector. So this is going to lead to dangling pointers. So of course, you know, as C++ developers, we know we can give them a stable identities just by allocating each of them in the heap. We can use the modern unique pointer to make sure they don't leak. Of course, still we could have dangling pointers here because, well, what if I remove a person? You still have a pointer in the other side. Well, we can add shared pointers on this side and a weak pointer on the other side. And in this way, at least we can detect that we have a friend that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I, I don't like this, right? I think this is an object fetishist uh, design. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial. I have lots of identity problems. But I'm sure that my identity is not a pointer. I'm not a pointer. So why are you talking about me as a pointer in your program? Um, I would argue that things become much easier when you give me an identity explicitly. And once you give me an identity explicitly, then we are freed to use whatever representation we want for the other types. So we can basically go back to using a normal vector of people, which is actually also a very efficient representation, as you may know, and just use a vector of IDs to declare the friendships. 
And now, you know, things become playful. We separated the model from the representation. And we can use more efficient data structures like, you know, a set and a map, or we can even just move the friendships to the top level to be able to have reciprocal uh, friendships in an easier way. You know, we can be playful with our data model once we really move uh, the fundamentals to values. So in this sense, I think, especially in C++, which is a multi-paradigm uh, language with a million tools to shoot yourself in the foot, things are not really black and white. Like, on the one extreme, you have tools that are the low-level tools, that are very reference semantic. Reference semantics, and it's basically talking about references to objects, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, you have tools that allow you to program in a more value semantic way. And the good news is that you can always move from using reference semantic in the low level and use abstraction to build value semantics on top of them. And I'm going to give a few examples of how can you do that. Let's look at this function. This is the pushback function of a vector. Now, is the pushback function value semantic, right? Like, I think we could agree that vectors are more or less like a value type because you can copy them without keeping references. But pushback itself, I would argue that it's not very value semantic. It's very important in which vector object you execute this function, right? Because, for example, if you have iterators pointing in this object, they're going to be invalidated, similarly to what happened with the pointers that uh, we saw before. So you have to think. You cannot understand the meaning of this program without understanding the references and the objects. Now, the basic tool for abstraction in C++ is functions. And we can just grab this in a function to make it uh, value semantic. So we create a pushback function that takes the vector as a value. And we have the tool, copy constructors, and all these things to help us make this just value semantic. We call the pushback and then return the new vector, right? Now this function, I would argue, is fully value semantic, right? You, to understand what a program doing, uh, executing this function does, you don't really need to understand uh, what objects the values really live in. Um, another example. Is this value semantic? I have a class foo that is keeping its implementation in a shared pointer internally? Well, I would say it depends. And it depends on the interface. If impl is treated in an immutable way, if nothing in the interface allows you to, mut to mutate it, then, well, even though the representation between the different values is going to be shared, that is going to be a secret that is not visible through the interface. And you cannot understand users of foo just by, looking, uh, by talking about the values, right? How do we do this? Well, basically, it means that all modifiers need to be const, right? So if I want to uh, modify foo, what I really need to do is to clone the implementation object, mutate it, and then return a new one, right? Now, you could argue that this is not very efficient. And this is true. This could be overkill in many contexts in which you know that the old version of foo is not going to be used anymore. So one tool that I really like, maybe my favorite feature from C++11, it's move semantics. And with move semantics, what we can do is define another overload that takes an R value reference to this object. And for me, like, the simplest definition of R value reference is that an R value reference is a reference that has the promise that you are, if you have an R value reference, an object that is an R value reference, you are the only person that has a reference to this object. Now, if I am the only person that has a reference to this object, I know that if I mutate it in place, nobody's going to see it. So I can optimize this. Well, you have to still be careful, because we have a share pointer. So we also have to check in the share pointer 
that this is unique, basically that we are really the only object in our program that has a reference to this implementation. And now, in, when these two conditions meet, so this is a moved from value, and the, there is no other copies of this, we can actually do the mutation in place. Otherwise, we do the full copy as we did before, right? Now, oops, sorry. One caveat, if you're using shared pointer, they've deprecated the unique method because it's defined to be non-thread safe. So if you really want to implement this pattern, you need to use a different implementation of shared pointer, custom made or something. Um, but, but yeah, this is a, a very interesting tool to, to achieve the same performance as mutating uh, while still having a value-oriented API. Now, a third example of how to think about values. Um, let's say I want to represent in my program the computer screen. And now you're going to be like, hey, the computer screen, there's only one. You cannot copy it. Where's the copy constructor of your screen? You need a factory for that, right? Um, and it's true. But I can still have a value-oriented API if I say, well, the only way to modify the, the object is to do this again in an R value. So what you're saying is, well, I have values, but in order to create a new value, I have to destroy my old value, right? which is what happens in the real world. If I print in the screen, well, the old state goes away. And you can express this in C++ by saying, I am drawing on an R value. Um, if you were programming in Rust, actually, you will get like extra advantages, like the compiler will tell you if you're doing things wrong in this way. In C++, that's not the case, but this is a, a way to, to think about the screen in a value. But you could argue also that this is like cheating, right? Like in the end, I'm changing the syntax, but I'm not really changing the way I'm programming. Like this is maybe a way to, to make more evident the linearity of the operations that one draw creates another value and things happen in sequence. But it's kind of bending the rules of the language. So there are other ways uh, you could maybe think about the screen in terms of a value and that I might consider better, which is basically separating, uh, mutating the world from creating a description of the mutations we want to do in the world. This is a pattern that is very common in purely functional programs. In particular, in Haskell, this is the only way you can mutate the world by creating a specification of what you want to do. So if I want to draw to the screen, instead of really drawing to it, what I'm going to return in this case, it's a function that is actually going to draw to the screen. And in this case, this function takes a context object. And ideally, in my program, this context object is very hard to access, <laughs> such that most code creates specifications, combinations of these draw calls to create more and more complex definitions of what should be drawn to the screen. And then this is, at the end of our pipeline, fed to another system that evaluates this in some context and actually creates the mutations. Right? So this is another way to separate uh, our physical world from our value world. And there's one fourth uh, interesting uh, way I would like to show to go from uh, mutation to values. And let's say I want to, uh, I have an API, like the one I have in the web browser. There is a JavaScript API in the web browser to manipulate uh, the document that is presented to the users, right? And this is the API that people use to make web applications, basically. But instead of using this mutable API directly, I can say, well, I want to represent my document as a value. So my, what I'm representing in the screen might be you know, this set of uh, HTML tags that you might recognize. It's a tree that represents what's presented in the screen. When I need to update what's presented in the screen, I just return a completely new value. In this case, it's a completely new value that has just a small differences. So I changed the text of the button and I added a new uh, entry to, to a list. Now to map this back to the, 
to the mutable API that is under the hood, what you can do is to use a different algorithm to basically compare these two values, see that it's only these two little things that change, and automatically your framework will generate the particular mutations that are needed to update this in the most efficient way, even though my program was only concerned with these specifications. And this is actually uh, the technique uh, the technique used by a very popular framework called React.js, probably most of you have heard of it even if you're not uh, JavaScript developers. And I think it's a really useful technique that could be actually applied to many of the programs uh, or, or the problems that uh, we have in C++. So then the question is, we know that what values are, and how can we create a more value way of thinking in our C++ program out of um, more objecty tools? The question is when to use value semantics. When should I go for reference semantics, and where should I go for value semantics? And I have changed throughout my career uh, in, in my opinion about this. I used to have this opinion, which I now consider not so great, which is that values are, used, are useful for micro design and objects are useful for macro design, for ar architecture. And I think this was just a lazy opinion I had because, of course, actually in the small, in micro design, C has lots of value tools, like ints are values, vectors are, are values, all these little tools they are values. So they're very easy to use and to, you know, it's easy to write a transform function, a pushback function that is value oriented. But when we think about our system, you know, we start thinking about these components that talk to each other and that have references to each other, that know about each other and tell each other, hey, do this, do that. You know, we, we stop thinking about functional programming, we start thinking about more imperative programming or object-oriented programming in an imperative way. Um, but I think that actually values are most valuable when they are applied to macro design, when really you try hard to express your architecture in terms of values and the, re and, and the relationships, and just use objects in the little tiny implementations, because objects, they are harmless in micro design, right? In, in micro design, you don't have so many moving parts. So you can actually use objects and not be crazy about it. But when you need to reason about more complex things, you need to forget about things, you need abstraction, as I said before, and you need uh, I would say values and functional programming, etc. So, in the second part of this talk, now we're going to try to apply this idea uh, to put it into practice by talking about a value based architecture for interactive software. <coughs> a little bit of water. So, I find interactive software very interesting because it's actually, I think, an underrated problem. Like it, it's, not that it, it's not that easy to build interactive software, but at the same time, it feels to me that it hasn't evolved that much in the last 30 years, how we write uh, interactive software, especially in C++. Like there are a lot of things happening in the JavaScript world, I think, but in C++, we're still stuck to this picture, which is the model view controller and many of you might have seen already. It's a way to decouple uh, the different components in, of an interactive system. So we have a model that is referenced by potentially multiple views, and the views contain basically the representation of this ideal model, and then there are these controllers that have more like behaviors of, of what happens when the user does things. Uh, and this is all good. This has very good intentions, but I think it fails at the point where these things in these boxes, they are objects, right? And the arrows, they represent references. So actually the view normally knows about the model directly and the model knows about the view indirectly because there is a callback installed in the model that has a pointer to the view such that it updates, right? And the problem with objects is that they don't really compose, right? If I have a setter in the model that triggers a callback whenever it's updated, such that the view updates, and now I want to make a more complex operation using, using this setter, 
I cannot get rid of this callback triggering, and now I'm going to have inconsistent states in, in, in this complex operation that are going to be presented to the view. And of course, there are many workarounds. But I think that the, the takeaway here is that when you add more and more views, and more and more controllers, and more and more models, there is no abstraction. You really have to have in your mind all the models, or the views, or the controllers in order to understand the system, because it doesn't compose. So in the end, we get with this flying spaghetti monster that takes over our code and eats our program. So I would propose another architecture that I will start with this picture, right? So I don't want to talk about it first so much in terms of programming entities, but more about the things that it's really part of an interactive system. And the first thing that is part of an interactive, an interactive system is a user that has some particular goals and objectives. That's why they're using our program. And they have a mental model of the world. Now, symmetric to this mental model of the world of the user, we're going to design a data model that is going to live in our program. And it's going to be a representation, of course, for the computer to understand what uh, or what is the shared understanding between what the user thinks and what the computer thinks. Now, of course, the user wants to achieve things, so the, the user is going to do things to manipulate the data model that lives in the computer. And finally, the user needs to get some feedback to see what is the computer understanding, so we're going to have views, which are you know, human consumable representations of this data model. And of course, these things are related to each other through transformations. So the user we, will use their, their will to apply actions. Then the actions will trigger an update in the data model. The data model the, will then be rendered into views. And then the views will be perceived by the user. Right? This is a very simplified picture, but I think it shows the cyclical nature of this interactive system. Now, cycles are bad. But we have big scissors, so we're going to cut this picture in the diagonal. And arguably, the top part of this picture is in the domain of UX design, and of user experience, and it's going to be part of the, what our design team is going to do. And as engineers, we're going to be concerned mostly with the bottom part of this picture. Now, when we draw this, we get a nice picture without cycles. A picture that starts with actions, goes to models, and goes to views. And this is what is called the unidirectional data flow architecture. And sometimes you may he have heard of the Flux architecture. I think uh, Facebook has very interesting documents describing this architecture. And it's becoming more and more popular uh, in the web world to try to make uh, web applications, interactive web applications, easier to write. And what I find really compelling about this architecture is that the boxes here, they are not objects. They are values. So we have an action value that then is related to the model. And it's related to the model not through a reference. It's related to the model through, uh, we knew this was going to happen. <coughs> oh, video switching off, says here. Oh, how can I cancel from video? Is there a technician in the room? <laughs> or Please push the button to switch video. OK. That's what I've been doing. Oh, here. OK, it's this one. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, now it's switching them up. So anyways, um, while the video switches on, um, I can say that, yeah, these arrows, they are functions, right? And they are functions in the mostly mathematical sense, right? In this thing that relates to values. So the action 
is related to the model through an update function that we will see the signature in a second or a few seconds in the screen um, which basically it's a function that takes the current state of the world of the model as a value it also takes the action that happened the stimulo stimuli that comes from the world as a value and returns a new data model value this is the update function uh, sometimes it's called reducer because we talked about accumulate before. There is this notion of reducing, in this case we're reducing the sequence of model states that happen through time. Uh, sorry, no, the, the, the sequence of actions, the sequence of actions that happen through time, we're reducing it, um, producing um, a more refined model through time. Then uh, we're going to have another function, which is going to be, uh, if you're using React, it's basically the render function that takes uh, the data model as a value and then it returns a view as a value. And of course this to be implemented efficiently it requires something like React, the system I described before, but I would say that sometimes just having an immediate mode API is enough to really start uh, having... Interesting, now I just have to configure this uh, double And I guess only one of the things is uh, maybe that one. Yeah, we can only see the the slide number there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, what happens if I unplug and replug? Are, are we gonna have to wait again? No, I don't think. So. Okay, I'm gonna try this, and then if it doesn't work. Why did you do this, Quampe? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, oh, that's what I see. That's what you see. Uh, <laughs> okay, well. Um, oh? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, <coughs> okay, going back to this. Yeah, so we have the render function that takes a model and returns a new view. And, oh, one second, I need to make sure I have something configured for later. Um, okay, perfect. Um, that returns a new view. And if you don't have such a nice API because you don't have React.js, maybe you can just use an immediate mode API. An immediate mode API is one in which you say draw, 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 do this, do this, do that. And this is kind of like a function, and as we saw before, you can have actually little tools already to try to think about these updates, these explicit updates of the view um, uh, as a value. Finally, of course, you're going to have a way to retrofit into the system, right? So um, somewhere in your view framework, uh, you're going to have a way to listen for input from the user. And from this input, you need to be able to dispatch new actions that are going to start the circle again. Now, to put this into practice, I want to show you an example, a probably very disappointing example, because it's, um, it's a very simple uh, program. Uh, let me see, it's demo time like this, perfect. And If you don't know what this Nix shell is, it's the best uh, package manager you can imagine ever. Um, and I use it to, for my developer environment. Um, okay, so now I have here this counter app, counter, I think it's called STD, uh, where you know it's a counter that has a value, and then I can give it commands like plus to increment it, minus to decrement it, plus plus, and then I think the dot to reset it. Very disappointing. But I think I, don't, um, I want to show you something very simple so we don't get distracted by the meat of the application, but instead we can talk about how the different components are uh, put together in this app. So if we go back to uh, 
the slides. Um, I can show you uh, how this is built uh, with this architecture. First thing we need is the model, right? And in this case, I'm just going to have a struct that contains the value uh, that I want to update. And then we need actions, right? So the different things I can do in my program, I'm going to represent them as types, right? Because I want to have the actions of values, and the values belong to some type. So I have an increment action type, a decrement action type, and a reset action type. Now, I need one single action value. How can I put three different types together as one type? C++17, std variant, right? So I can have a variant that can be uh, either of these things, right? So it's a union type. It means uh, action values can be uh, of one of these different types. Now, once I have my actions and my model, I can start implementing these other two functions. The first one is the update function. And the update function basically takes a model, the action, as we said, and returns a new version of the model. So what we're going to do is to visit the variant and then do case analysis. So if the action is an increment action, then we're going to increment the value. If it's a decrement action, we're going to decrement it, blah, blah. And in either case, we're returning a new value. Now, for those of you that are not familiar, std visit is a standard thing that allows you to look at what's inside the variant, right? Because the variant could be either of these things. And uh, lager visitor, it's a small tool. Uh, it's something sometimes called overloads or something. Uh, if you look for the std visit function, uh, sorry, page in CPP reference, you will see how to implement this function. Basically, what it allows you uh, is to have lambdas as the way to discriminate the different cases of what's in there. So it's nice because it looks almost like a weird looking switch case that, um, depending on the types, uh, does one thing or, or another. Um, now, this function is nice, right? Like it's very easy, for example, to write unit tests that test this function because I just pass it a value, I get a new one. It doesn't depend on anything else in the system, right? I can have even, I can run my tests in parallel. And that's nice because it's values. And finally, I need to have the draw function or the render function. In this case, uh, I'm just drawing directly, as I said, using the immediate mode API, which is uh, C out. Now, there is another function that I didn't show uh, in the uh, architecture, in the original architecture picture, but I could put in there, which is interesting. It's mapping uh, what I would say the low level event that I get from my UI framework uh, to the actions, right? Because I like to keep my actions related to my, what you would call often business logic or application logic, right? So you want your actions and your model to be reusable and independent of the UI that you're using. So in this case, the intent is basically depending on the character that has been pressed, I'm going to return the actual action that this character uh, is represented. And finally, we can put all these pieces together by just having a loop in our main function where I just read events from the terminal. Uh, then I map them through the intent function, right? And I get actions out of the events. So the events are the characters. And then uh, from the characters, I get actions. Or I can get an action. It's an optional, right? So because there are characters that do nothing. Um, and then I basically update the state uh, using the update function, and then I draw it. Now, what I really like about this picture is that there is basically only one mutable object that lives through the whole application, right? Which is uh, this state uh, variable. You could argue the event one also, but that's like uh, you could also make that not into into a you could reduce the scope of that, of that variable. But really, this state variable is the only mutable object that lives through the whole application. And even further, it's hidden, right? 
it's only known in this function. Nothing, none of my, of my business logic, of my application logic, of my drawing logic has a mutable reference to this model. They just have copies of this value or const reference to this value. And this is what we wanted to, to achieve with this. So um, I show you, I just, I've just shown you how, how to implement this architecture for a terminal application. Uh, but if you're doing something more complex, you might want to rely on a framework. So there are different frameworks you can use. And as I said, this architecture has been mostly explored in the web world, where you have even a language, a programming language called Elm, that is something I would call like Haskell for beginners. It's a functional programming language designed to make interactive web applications that basically has this architecture as a foundational element in the language. In this language, instead of a main function, you declare a draw and an update function, and a model, and an, and an action type. Um, then you have uh, frameworks uh, like Redux, which is a, um, a framework that is very often used in combination with React.js, but it's actually independent from it. And I made a small library called Lager um, that is uh, basically Redux for C++. And I wouldn't say uh, it's, it's not really meant to be used for production. It's a very simple library. It's also just a way to show you uh, the potential of this architecture. So let's say I want to make my application a little bit more interactive. Uh, so I'm going to re-implement my application, or not the whole application, but just the view part and the input part, um, using NCourses, which is this framework for doing interactive uh, terminal applications. So now if I show you, uh, if I go back here, um, I think it's going to earn courses and I'm going to open directly the meta version. So now I have something, you know, a bit more fancy and I don't need to press enter. I can just directly interact with the application. Okay. Um, so this is built already uh, oops, using the framework. And the, the meat of this framework is this make store function. So forget about the first one. Uh, this make store function uh, basically creates a store for our data model that is going to uh, arbitrate all the accesses to it. And we're going to tell the store what the initial value is of the data model. We're going to tell it what the update, the reducer, is, and what the view is. And finally, I'm going to tell it how is my event loop implemented. So it can actually schedule in a thread-safe way all the actions that are going to happen in the application. So it also helps uh, a little bit with adding concurrency to your application. Uh, in this case, we're using Boost ASIO. If you know what it is, you know, it allows you to read streams of data in an asynchronous way. In this case, we want to read the terminal uh, input asynchronously. That's why I'm using Boost ASIO. And I made a, a small C++ wrapper around NCourses that uses Boost ASIO. And then I can say, well, I have this terminal object. Please listen for events, keyboard events. And whenever a keyboard e event happens, I'm just going to dispatch the the, um, the actions. So this dispatch function is a function that was in the blue line at the end in the architecture that allows me to say to the world, please, there is a new action, evaluate it and update the world. Uh, and I dispatch whatever comes from, uh, of course, mapping the event uh, through the intent. And finally, I, I call run on the main loop such that the application just runs, processes the events, and so on. So in this case, uh, the, the store, yeah, it's, it's a mutable thing, but it actually even like hides this mutable variable from me. The only thing I need to do is to put these pieces together, and once I, uh, they're there, it, it just does it. Now, what's nice about this? Well, what's nice now is that we can extend our application uh, automatically using generic tools. And I've built a tool uh, that I call a time traveler uh, debugger or time, 
traveler inspector. I didn't really invent uh, this, so the Redux people also provide a time traveler debugger with it, and I was like, hey, I can do this in C++ also. Where basically, just by instantiating this debug server, and then telling the store, enable this debug server, I'm gonna get something that I'm gonna show you uh, in a second. So I'm gonna go back to uh, the application. This is the application. I, I'm running the application, the version already that has the debugger enabled. So to access the debugger, uh, I'm gonna just visit a web page. So this debugger is actually exposing. Oh no, it's a uh, wrong URL. I changed this. Uh, it's giving me a UI, which by the way is written in Elm, just to play also a little bit more uh, with this uh, architecture, that shows me a history of all the states of the application. So this number that I see in the right part of the debugger is basically uh, everything that happened in the application. So uh, we can see here that the last thing that happened is that I triggered an increment action and that this led to the value 6 uh, being uh, the current state of the model, which is yeah, what I see there. But I can click here and see, well, a few interactions ago, actually, the model had the value 4, and I actually had just decremented with the result of a decrement. And, you know, I can uh, navigate this and easily inspect all the states of my application, which is really useful, you know, if you're trying to, to find a bug. But even further, I can just press Enter here, I think, or I can double click. And then the application itself moves to that state. So I can actually see what's going on there. Right? So basically, without implementing undo ourselves, we got like a magical undo, like a global undo that is applied to the whole application. Just because we're operating with values. There is something this magic debugger is doing, which is basically storing the values of the different states of the application and the values of the actions and uh, displaying them here. Um, is there something else I can show you here? No, I think, yeah, that's that. Of course, I can also, so I can go back to a, a state and I can still use the application, right? So I, if I interact, now of course, um, I don't have branching in the way I store things, so the, the future is removed like normally when you do redo, like the future is removed, and I got these new states there. You could imagine like an enhanced version of this where you could actually even like just get a tree and branch off and have all the branches of all the things you, you did with your application, why not? Um, so I want to show you a little bit how this is built. So the meat of this happens in this enable debug uh, thing. What's that question? No. In this enable debug thing, uh, which is what the Redux people call an enhancer, which is basically going to grab our model and our view in with other things. It's going to extend it. How is it going to extend it? Well, let me show you. This debugger thing I, it's going to be just like a scope that I'm going to use to define these extensions, right? So it's templated over the action and model. The action and model are the actions and model of the application that I'm applying this into. And they are generic, right? So the, the debugger doesn't make any assumptions about what the actions and model look like. What it just does is to extend it. So basically, the debugger is going to define its own actions, like go to action, to go to a particular state. That's why I could double click in a state and go to it. Um, and then also an undo action and a redo action, which is more or less like an alias for go to minus one and go to plus one. Now, what are the actions of the extended application? The first one is an action of the application itself. So, if when I click um, or when, when I was using my arrow keys in the application, it was actually creating an action of the debugger that contain an action of the application. And that's going to be delivered to the underlying reducer. But it also provides its own go-to action, undo action, and redo action. Then it defines its own model. Now, what's this extended model? Well, first, it contains the, initi the initial value, 
the initial value that was provided to the store. And then uh, it has a cursor position that is going to tell me where in the history I am when I was doing undo. And then it contains a vector of pair of actions and models, right? Which is more or less what we were seeing in the, in the debugger, right? That, that's a, a very direct representation of, the, uh, of what we were seeing. Now, this is an Emir vector. It's not an STD vector. It could actually be also implemented with an STD vector. Uh, but Emir is a library I wrote. Uh, I will put a link at the end of the presentation also to another talk about it that implements immutable data structures. And basically, immutable data structures, you could think of using all these tricks that I mentioned about move semantics to be able to give you value types that are more efficient, right? So I don't want to copy all this vector whenever I produce a new model. Otherwise, my application will become slower and slower as I use it. But thanks to this library, actually, it's a constant factor uh, cost that it has to have the debugger enabled. Um, then, of course, I need to be able to create a debugger model out of the application model, which just fills the initial value. And I need to be able to convert the uh, the debugger model back to the application model such that I can represent it, right? And in this case, we just take the current model depending on the current position in the history. Finally, we need to define our update function. And our update function takes the model, the action, but it also needs to know what is the, uh, the reducer, the update function of the underlying application, such that when you get an action of the application, we call it, and there is uh, an ellipsis there because it also does other things. In particular, it will put it in this vector of, um, or in the history, basically, of what happened. And then there is the other actions that, you know, they're an exercise for the reader to implement. It's basically manipulating the cursor. Uh, now, we saw this is generic, right? Like, I can debug any application with this, as long, of course, it's composed of value-based actions and models. And it does so by defining its own value-based models. Well, I can use function composition here, because actually enable debug is a function. So I can just compose them with function composition. This comp thing is like the dot operator in math. And I can enable another debugger to debug the debugger, which I'm going to call the meta debugger here. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example to see how it, look li it looks like. And um, so this is the debugger um, that uh, we've been using so far. Now I can open another instance of the browser, and I can go to localhost, and I think I need to add a one here. And of course I need to remove this. Uh, okay, so now I'm seeing the state of the debugger of the application. Or of the, of the first debugger, right? Because this debugger also has a state, which you could also inspect, right? Uh, so we see, like, we've messed quite a bit with um, with the application, right? So, uh, I, okay, actually, I can see here also now. Um, so if I go here, there is 11 states here, right? But in the in the other debugger, in the meta debugger, I have many more states, right? Because some of the things that I did was to undo, which erased a state. But of course, whenever I undo, the debugger itself goes to a new state. So these states are not lost. So actually, I can now undo the undos. <laughs> and I don't know what we see. OK, let, let's try. OK, so I can undo here, right, a few times. And now, when I undo here, you see the other one moves forward, right? And I can see basically what I told you before 
uh, like the, the, data, the data model that we described before is what we see here, right? So in this case, um, uh, what we're saying is, well, the type of what happened is, uh, you know, if there are templates involved, so it's a long thing, but it's basically this wrapper uh, variant. Um, and in this case, it's like a go-to action, like you could see it if we went to the very end. Uh, and I can see it also because it says, well, put the cursor in position six, right? That's the action uh, that we did. Uh, and then here we can see, well, the model, which is the history of everything that ever happened with the application, right? Wow. <laughs> so now, why not? Let's take it one level further, right? Let's go counter and courses meta meta. And let's see what happens. Like, I'm going to see the program before it was ever compiled. Maybe before I programmed it. You can see me in the screen programming it. No. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see what happens. No? Oh, it's broken now. Oh my god. <laughs> What's going on here? this computer now. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I guess don't use too many meta debuggers, just two is enough. Um, and don't use shared mutable state, of course. Um, so, oops. Uh, <coughs> okay, so <laughs> I think this is a good point to move finally towards the conclusion of this talk. Um, and there are maybe uh, a couple of last pointers I'm going to leave of ideas that I didn't have time to cover in this presentation, but that maybe uh, you would like to, to read more about in the future. And the first one is uh, the notion of effects. So um, I talked about this update function, but this update function is a pure function in the functional programming sense, right? It should not have effects. It should not manipulate the world. It should not load a file or save a file. 
How can we do that, integrate that in the system? Actually, uh, the library provides uh, one tool which is uh, inspired by basically how they solve the, the problem in Elm, which is that the update function has a, another signature that you can use instead where you can return a model, the new state of the world, and an effect. What is an effect? A function that, um, that has side effects and that is evaluated outside of the update function itself. So the update function can be you know, tested in a very safe way and then you are free to maybe evaluate or not these side effects that should come out of it. Uh, this is kind of related to this pattern I was talking about before, right? Where when you want to have an effect to the world, you don't do it directly, you return a function that is going to do it uh, when evaluated in a particular context. Um, the other thing I didn't talk about much uh, is uh, performance, right? Because, yeah, you will be thinking there are lots of copies here. Like whenever I evaluate the update function, I get a new copy, I, am I copying everything? And as I hinted before, there are tools to avoid so much copying. If you embrace completely this kind of value-based approach, you can actually then design your data structures to make this pattern efficiently. Um, I wrote a library, as I said, of immutable data structures that are designed to be used in this value-oriented way. And there is a talk from CPPCon, if you're uh, interested, where, where I talk a little bit more about them. And one of the things I show is actually a text editor that is written using this architectural pattern. It actually uses this library now that can load files as big as a gigabyte, and you can edit it, copy-paste, super fast. Um, and it also has features like concurrent loading, Right? And the code is very short. It's like, I think, 2,000 lines of code, the whole editor. And, you know, concurrent loading, it's a tricky feature to implement if you're really dealing with uh, mutable objects. But it's not so much uh, using this architecture. Um, the other interesting topic that I uh, didn't have time to cover here is um, about continuous values. And another take on this, um, on this value-oriented approach that is based, I don't know if you remember, um, when I talked about how to map things to, into values, there were three ways, right? It was, the first one was the value of the whole existence, the second was the snapshots, and the third one was the identities. And in this talk, kind of, or in the second part of this, of this talk, we've used an architecture that relies mostly on the second point, which was snapshots, right? We have the model, which is a snapshot of the world in a particular time, and they are connected through the actions. Um, but in highly concurrent system with lots of things happening in parallel, you may want to represent these processes themselves, a concurrent process as a value, using something like a reactive stream. And uh, there is a very nice talk uh, from Kirk Schub, who wrote RxCPP and works uh, for Microsoft that is called No Raw STD Thread, which basically yeah, tries uh, to teach us how to do complex, uh, highly asynchronous systems in a more value-oriented way, using reactive strings. Um, finally, just to recap, I think we covered quite a few topics here. I would say the take-home idea is try to use more value semantics when doing macro design. We're implementing or defining the architecture of your system. And of course, use objects then to make it efficient uh, at the end. Thank you very much. These are the links to actually all the software uh, I've presented. So Lager, which is the uh, Redux library, Emer, the data structures, Edwig, the text editor, and my personal web page. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We're a little bit uh, late, but I don't know if we have time for questions. No or worries. We definitely yeah. have time for questions. Yeah. So I was going to say once again, okay. thank you very much for well, the great presentation. Maybe we can open up the room for any questions. Yes? Uh, so thank you for your great talk. Um, and I also saw that your effects have actually functions, right? Yes. So I was just wondering if that is that unit testable? How can I check if my update function returns the correct effect? Uh, 
Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, the effects are also functions, can they be unit testable? And um, I mean, yes and no. They, of course, they can and should be unit tested. But uh, they are functions in the sense that they are C++ functions, but they are not functions in the, in the, um, in the mathematical sense. Because the idea is that this function actually could, you know, open a file and read it. That's one of the things that you might want to do. Yeah, of course. I mean, like, I, I agree, actually, that that's kind of yeah, going in a more declarative way of uh, exposing these effects. I will say that uh, is something that the framework is not going to give you. You have to uh, do that yourself. I would argue also, like, at some point, I mean, you're going to do the effect in the, in the real world. Right? Like, for example, how do you check the correctness of the transformation between that specification and the thing that actually reads the file? Right? Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I agree that um, in, in like as much as possible, you should try to describe things as values and ideally as intelligible values as opposed to an opaque function, which is, I guess, uh, what you're trying to, to propose here, uh, such that you can test this and then transform that specification into something more low level. Actually, th there was a very nice talk last year also at uh, Meeting C++ uh, by, um, I forgot his name, I think he, he talked just before me. Uh, Kevin. Huh? Kevin. Yeah, yeah, Kevin Henning, called uh, Declarative Thinking, uh, or Declarative Programming, Declarative Thinking, which is basically uh, uh, talking about that idea and extending that um, uh, yeah, into a, a whole talk. So if you're interested in that topic, I think that's a, a, an interesting follow-up uh, video to, to see. Any other questions? Yeah. Why would you do that in C++? Like, use this style of programming. I mean, like, why would you stick to C++ and not just move to Haskell? So the question is, why would you use C++ to begin with instead of just doing this in Haskell? Um, and good point. Maybe I should be programming in Haskell instead. Um, it, in fact, uh, as I said, the UI of this debugger, I did in Elm. I didn't do that in, in C++. Uh, but I think there are times in which we have to use C++. Uh, for performance reasons mostly. Like for example, I worked a lot in music software, and music software has an audio engine that has real-time constraints on how you process the data. So that gives you basically C++ or maybe Rust uh, or C. Um, so if I have to use C++ for the audio engine, then maybe I also need you know, a way to talk to the audio engine about my data model, blah, 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 blah. I end up needing something like this. But yeah, in many cases, maybe C++ is not even the right language. Uh, yeah, depends on your domain. Any other questions? All right, then. So I'm going to anyways uh, stick around so we can talk more about this uh, over a beer. And thank you very much again. Thank you.